The presidency has welcomed the judgment of the UK court, granting Nigeria's application for an extension of time and relief from sanctions in a $10 billion arbitration case with Process and Industrial Development Limited, PNID, in Nigeria. The senior special assistant to the president on media and publicity, Garba Sheu, made the position known in a statement in Abuja on Friday. Sheu said, in our view, the judgment is right, just, and provides a strong prima facie case that the fraudulent gas deal with PNID and the subsequent judgment debt of $10 billion against Nigeria was a clear attempt to cheat the country of billions of dollars by a company that had not invested one naira in the country. He expressed delight with the processes that led to this outcome in the English court. He noted that the judgment had given relief to the Nigerian government to further protect its national assets from criminally minded organizations and individuals. We are now joined by Akintayo Iwilade, the legal, a legal practitioner. He joins us live in the studio. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It is Iwilade, right? Iwilade, I can Iwilade. Tell you. It's a pleasure, pleasure to, to have you join Thank us. You. All right, let's start with the, I mean, how rare is this decision? Because a lot of persons are saying it is not a common decision for such a, a high court uh, to take. And the, the sense of vindication that is coming off, is it quick is it too quick or are we on course so two questions yeah two, two questions like I, I i think i would like to kick off from what the uh, senior special advisor to the president said when he said that the presidency welcomes the decision i think it's not just the presidency that welcomes the decision i think every nigerian who should welcome that decision and i do agree with you that it is indeed a rare type of decision particularly because particularly because what you find is that the contemplation of law usually is that when an arbitral award is given, it's often, oftentimes always final. But where there are vitiating factors, very, in very rare instances such as fraud and some other sort of factors, you, get the, you see an instance where you can challenge it and seek a variation of that and, and outright setting aside. But even at that, you would find that it's also rare that given the time that this award had been you know, given against Nigeria, we're talking of a period of you know, not less than two years. Now, it's very rare for you to see the court even granting an extension of time to challenge that. But Nigeria put up a very, very good case, you know, good and persuasive argument, and I think the entire thing should be commended for that effort. And if you read the judgment, you know, the, the judgment indeed acknowledged the rarity of this situation because the judgment listed about 10 instances, 10 different cases decided authorities where extension of time, such as being sought by Nigeria, had been sought, and where at least about 60 to 70 percent of them were refused. So Nigeria is truly in a good uh, stead, and I think uh, the country should you know, be commended for so, that. So what, what is the interpretation one now gives? Because Nigeria has, from the onset, been screaming that there was fraud um, in the whole process. You know, there was nothing legit about it, and the court still went ahead to grant that, you know, the, the initial decision, what does that say about the entire process, really? Yes, I, I think at the initial point, the, 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 the subject of fraud was not really the focal point of the Nigerian defense, if you look at the initial uh, judgment leading to the award and all of that. The, the question of fraud was a subsequent argument presented by Nigeria based on discoveries that were made after the award and the current judgment made that point because the other side did try to argue that Nigeria cannot be raising the argument of fraud and all these vitating elements at this stage when it had the opportunity to have raised it then. But the court was quick to point that out, and the Nigerian legal team were also quick to point that there was no way Nigeria could have raised those arguments of fraud because they were very complex in nature. It was like a it was like a racket of itself, and that so it took some time for Nigeria to flag that identify it and then pursue it in terms of you know, investigations. And it's only made you know, logical sense that it was after that investigation had been you know, primarily concluded that then Nigeria could present 
that argument of, of so based on what you're saying uh, some are saying we should be commending the office of the agf for sticking with this case and coming out in spite of all the you know um, cry and anger against his office for not doing due diligence and then on the flip side from what you've said it means that they didn't seem to have prepared adequately in order to go for that case in the first instance otherwise that ruling wouldn't have come in the first instance well i i think we should uh i think we should recognize the timelines in all of these events that this situation predates the coming into office of the current Attorney General of the Federation and indeed the coming into office of the current administration of President Mohamed Buhari. And of course, all of the, the, the groundwork leading Nigeria into this, you know, this, this, this problem had occurred before the administration came in. So, and if you look at that judgment, there were litany of correspondences that were reported even in that judgment, which I believe have now been presented to the UK court, showing the consistent efforts that were being made by the current administration in exchange of, you know, between the public officials at the highest level, between the attorney general, the vice president, the president, and all relevant officials looking at all of these issues and looking at how best to, to take on it. And at every point, clearly from the detailed judgment, you would see that the relevant steps were being taken, even though some of these things might not have been in the public domain, but with the judgment now we can see that indeed a lot of steps were taken to reverse what had already been, been, been done. And I think they should be commended for reversing something that had really gone bad prior to their emergence. Or into okay, let's, let's look at the way, I mean, what is next? Um, a lot of persons are saying that the enthusiasm now could be a bit overrated because this is just a stay of judgment, not an outright dismissal um, of uh, the ruling that was given. So what is the way forward? And shouldn't we really be commending the work that has been done by the AGF office? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, one uh, critical office we, are, we need to also you know, commend, and a person we also need to very commend seriously as Nigerians, is the person of the Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshibaju. Yes, I was going to get to okay, that. Yes. Yeah. To no, go ahead. Go okay, ahead. Because you would, you would find that from the judgment that I, I read, the vice president flagged at some point in the course of, in spite of the fact that settlement discussions were going on, because at that time it was being seen that perhaps this is a commercial dispute and all of that. But, it, you know, the, I guess the professor of evidence in him kept on looking at this, that this is really not a commercial dispute. There are fundamental elements of fraud in the procurement uh, process, even in the representations and misrepresentations made by this company, the PNID company to Nigeria about its capability, about the process through which it got the contract awarded to it and all of those things. And we, you know, so, so it's, an, it's, a, it's a team work from what I can see from that judgment that the vice president, you know, true to type was able to identify and say that I think that we should pursue this angle of fraud. We should look at it very more closely. He made that uh, recommendation to the president, of course, with, in collaboration with the Attorney General of the Federation, and together as a team, they've been able to end Nigeria this temporary respite. But to the question as to whether this, you know, whether we should celebrate with caution, I do recognize that this is the beginning of a journey that is likely to be much longer. But the, the wordings of that judgment gives us a very high glimmer of hope because the judge made it clear that Nigeria, he didn't say Nigeria just uh, made a prima facie case. He said Nigeria has made out a strong prima facie case of fraud and that that is sufficient basis to enable, and he did also recognize the rarity of the situation that ordinarily this application by Nigeria would not have been granted. But because of the complex web of you know, fraudulent intents that Nigeria has alleged with supporting evidence that it thinks that in the broadest interest of justice, Nigeria should be allowed that opportunity to retry and take these arguments forward. And one other point that you know, Nigerians need to know and that which may also interest you members of the fourth estate of the REM is that the promoter of PNID himself, the late uh, Mr. Quinn, the entire decision of the, uh, which led to the arbitral, a significant part of that decision rested on Queen's statement on oath. Now, Nigeria has been able to make a representation to the British court to say that these statements made by Mr. Queen, a lot of them amounted to perjury, that he perjured in the sense that 
They made false representations as to their capabilities to engage in this contract. They made false representations as to the amount of effort and you know, alleged expenses they had made into the procurement of this contract. And that all of the claims that this uh, Mr. Quinn made have turned out by investigation to be false claims. And the UK government accepted, the UK court accepted that argument. So it's on record. So if a judgment has been procured on the basis of a perjury, if a judgment has been procured, I mean the arbitral award has been procured on the basis of uh, fraud, if it has been procured on the basis of also, you know, varied, you know, allegations, strong allegations of bribery, corruption, and all of those sort of things, I think that there's a, a good glimmer for hope. I don't know how much time we have, but I know... Okay. Um, uh, yes. We have some time, but let me okay. ask you, off what you were saying, yes. um, initially when the case got, came, we were saying um, we, we, it needed to be tried here in Nigeria yes. because, I mean, you, can, you can't be trying um, our case in a foreign court since yes. it's a, a federal government case. And that was ruled out, and then we now have this uh, judgment. If it were a Nigerian court, do you think that the due diligence that was um, expended by the British court would have been done here in Nigeria? Well, I, I like to continue to be hopeful about the Nigerian judicial system. Obviously, there are a lot of things we still need to do more. But I want to, be, I, I want to take my response to your question from this angle, that what in the first place could have led us to have made the seat of arbitration the, the, to be outside Nigeria in the first place? Everything about this contract from, the, from the, uh, the gas to be supplied, supposing it wasn't a, a fraud, the companies to participate in it, the beneficiaries, everything centrally was supposed to be and is supposed to be in Nigeria. How is it then that we then write, we make agreements, we, we make contracts with foreign entities, and then shift the place of adjudicatory resolution in the event of a dispute, we then shift the seat out of Nigeria. I think those are some of the lessons we have to take going forward, that this idea of you know, setting seats of arbitration, setting uh, different uh, principles of law, or setting you know, laws of different jurisdictions to resolve disputes that emanate from contracts, especially contracts with our own sovereign nation. As I think that that's not something that is to be encouraged, and that's something that every stakeholder, including the National Assembly, the leadership of the MBA, all of us as practitioners, and then you members of the press, to ensure that this sort of thinking, is, 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 it doesn't all go well for the good of the country because I imagine that if the seat of arbitration was in Nigeria, if the forum to determine the legality or otherwise of this contract was in Nigeria, perhaps we would have been able to have a, a less embarrassing adjudicatory process. But that is not to say that there are no, not a basis, for example, for commercial people who say, I don't want to have my uh, dispute commercially resolved, dispute resolved yeah. within the Nigerian legal system. Part of it is the, the delays that, we've had, that we have within the system. Part of it is also some of the allegations of some of the inefficiencies in the system and all of that. But that, to me, as important as those things are, and why we must continue to work at ensuring that these things are resolved from the highest levels of government to all of us, it is not a sufficient basis for investors who seek to make income from our people, make money from Nigeria. It's not a basis for them to say they cannot submit to education. Okay, I actually thought, thought we had more time, but I've just been told we're out of time. So I'll say thank you very much uh, for coming on The Breakfast this morning. Thank you very much for having yeah. me.